This video is brought to you by Liquid IV. If there's one thing we all need to be better about, it's staying hydrated. And even though I do my best to try to drink as much water as possible every day, there is a more efficient way to do that. Enter Liquid IV's Hydration Multiplier, a healthy electrolyte drink mix that turns any glass of water into a supercharged elixir. You may have seen some of these around before, but this is one of their newest flavors, strawberry. Drinking one liquid IV hydrates faster and more efficiently than water alone. And frankly, it tastes better than just plain water. These have more vitamin C in them than an orange and just as much potassium as a banana. It also has a bunch of vitamins known to boost your immune system. Vitamins B3, B5, B6, and B12. It also has a bunch of vitamins that I've never heard of and can't pronounce. Pantophenic acid, niacin, niacin? Those sound important. How many times have you been sitting in your chair and suddenly you feel a headache come on? Well, chances are that's from being dehydrated. Drinking one liquid IV can help alleviate that and make you into a healthier person. Or you ever have a night where you find yourself just drinking maybe a little too much? You lose 10% of your experience when you die? Well, all those vitamins in here can help with those hangovers too. Those lost experience points though, I'm sorry, there's no helping that. It's good to have a healthy, clean way to hydrate. And if you'd like to try Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier yourself, use the link in the description down below. I'll even put my personal discount code there. And if you use that, you will get 25% off of your order. That's Liquid IV and their Hydration Multiplier. And once again, thanks to them for sponsoring this video. Almost exactly one year after Final Fantasy IX, Final Fantasy X was released on the all new, impressive PlayStation 2. What followed was tremendous success, increased fandom, and mainstream exposure far beyond what Square could ever hope for. Even though the main character is wearing one third of pants and overalls. From here on out, the Final Fantasy games get weird. Each one is drastically different than the one previously. Hironobu Sakaguchi is no longer at the helm, the soundtracks are no longer solely composed by Nobuo Umatsu. Despite all that, Final Fantasy X was such a big deal when it came out, it quickly became one of the fastest selling PlayStation 2 titles despite the low install base. It was so popular that people were going around giving each other that Yevon hand gesture greeting. That is a true story, it happened to me. Alright, thank you for shopping here, would you like our 10% discount card and magazine subscription? Oh, no thank you! Have a nice day! That happened to me while I was working at GameStop. The story begins with a sunset, a collection of weapons, and a somber song guiding us right into meeting the characters, each one's face as melancholic as the scenery itself. There is no air of excitement or enjoyment, it's as if we stepped into a new world that has already been ruined. And as we quickly learn, that's exactly the case. The enthusiasm of playing a new game finally suppressed. We meet the main character and the first new major feature to Final Fantasy, voice acting. Listen to my story. This may be our last chance. Thus we hear the main character's name, duh, actually they never say his name. Even with voice acting, his name is never spoken because this is the only character's name you can change out of everybody. So really, we don't hear his name spoken by anybody else until Decidia Final Fantasy. Titus. Titus? It's pronounced Titus? Look, I, like every other single English-speaking person out there, has always pronounced it as Titus. It sounds better, it fits his theme of water, he's standing in water on the cover art, he's always swimming around, there's the whole blitzball thing, but nope, Titus. Look, I am with you on that it should be pronounced Titus, but I'm gonna do my best to go by the canonical pronunciation. So Titties here is our main character and provides a significant amount of narration and internal monologues throughout a majority of the story. After his brief introduction, this muted scene is followed up in the only way it possibly could. Early 2000s butt rock! Oh, 
Somebody get my Ginkgo jeans! A massive whale monster in its spawn decimates the city of Xanarkand, and we awaken in the world of Spira, setting forth a journey as we meet Riku, Waka, Lulu, Kimari, Oron, and Yuna. Each one of them is useful, likable, and tied to the story. Except for Kimari. Final Fantasy X is the first time the series takes a massive departure from what it's been known for, in more ways than one. After six games of the active time battle system, X goes back to completely turn-based, but still innovative and engaging in a new way. Every character can take as much time as they need selecting their actions and it immediately plays out. However, depending on what you choose affects when they can act again. For example, attacks are standard speed, defending makes their turn come back up faster, but more powerful spells like Fyraga or Ultima can make a character need more time before they can act again. This is all shown in a timeline on the screen. You know exactly when a character will have another turn or how the currently selected command will affect this timeline before you confirm it. Just as vital, you can see what enemy turn is coming up next. This allows you to strategize around these turns. You could go for an all-out attack that'll maybe win, but your party member could really use a heal before the next enemy turn, so on and so on. On top of this are actions that can manipulate other people's turns. Things like slow and haste can drastically alter the turn order. Or skills such as delay hit or quick hit may change things up also. There's a dance between maximizing action economy and not getting too punished. It works wonderfully, and this whole turn order thing is so good. So good, it was straight up copied by Lord of the Rings The Third Age. Further supplementing the amount of strategy in combat is that every character has a sort of specialty that makes them ideal for countering certain enemies. Flying enemies can't be hit by melee characters easily, but Waka can hit anything at range. Tidus can chop through fast enemies, Lulu's black magic takes down any elemental enemy, Oron's sword can pierce through high defense, Yuna for healing and summoning, Riku's steel insta-kills robots. Every single character can do something in battle that's useful, except for Kimari. On any character's turn, you can swap out for another party member not already in battle. So if you happen to come up against an enemy that your current party of three can't handle, it's an easy fix with the push of a button. On top of this is some battles having additional contextual commands or targets, and in some boss fights, the option for characters to shout extra dialogue for a stat bonus. All of this culminates in an excellent strategic battle system that rewards critical thinking, planning, and execution. Best of all, it's snappy! Every single command completes itself in an instant. Attacks are fast, switches are fast, animations are fast, spellcasting, not as fast, but still good. This is the quickest battle system of any Final Fantasy game, period. The fact that it isn't sluggish in the slightest has helped it avoid feeling archaic or dull. So what downsides are there to all of this? Well, because the character's specialty is resulting in a sort of rock-paper-scissors system, most enemies whose weaknesses get exploited usually get one shot. This makes a lot of battles completely inconsequential. There's no threat here, the random battles can be frequent, and it can feel like you're seeing the same enemy party makeup over and over and over again. Plus, Final Fantasy X does that thing where only the characters who are in battle get experience points. So then the usually quick battles can become cumbersome as you meticulously swap out each possible character and make them defend or something just so that they don't get left out. Which you'll generally want to do because you want to make sure everybody is getting as much delicious ability points as they can thanks to the new leveling system. Gone are experience points and the concept of leveling up. The Sphere Grid instead places every character around a large map, and earning Sphere levels means being able to move the characters that many spaces around the board. Any space that they are on or next to can be activated using special Sphere items, unlocking that bonus for that character. This could be a stat increase like additional hit points, strength, or accuracy, or it could be all new skills or unlocked magic spells. The Sphere Grid causes fascinating decision-making when it comes to forming your characters, because there are branching paths and optional nodes. You can speed through and go straight for that next spell or skill upgrade, but then you leave behind a branching path with several relevant stat increases. You could go back for them, sure, but then you're spending precious Sphere levels just to backtrack. This is further accentuated by locked-off paths and nodes. You can only access these by acquiring and expending key spheres to unlock them, which again, causes more decisions to be made. Hold off a second for a level 2 key sphere, or get upgrades now and spend the extra effort to go back for it. And if that wasn't enough, by the end of the game you have even more spheres showing up to mix things up. You can do things like instantly unlock abilities for someone that someone else already has, 
cause one character to warp to another one's current position, or have one character unlock and start going through someone else's sphere grid? You could make Oron go down the Yuna path and get healing spells, make Waka get more strength from Oron, so on and so on. There are tons of possibilities, and it's fun to explore every single character's options in their sphere grids. Except for Kimari. Alright look, I know I've been shitting on him this whole time, but there's a reason for it. Kimari doesn't have a home anywhere in the game. His sphere grid places him directly in the middle, with no clear path or archetype he's meant to fill. All he can do is follow someone else's sphere grid, and essentially make himself into a backup of whatever other party member. The thing is though, you never need a backup or second member of that role, because they can already handle it and do it much better than he can. And unlike everyone else, Kimari has no defined role in battle because all he can do is be a suckier backup version. He has no unique trait to quickly defeat enemies, and his blue magic, as usual, is underwhelming. Add to that, Kimari has no impact or meaning in the story, so he's just kind of… there. Kimari isn't just small Ranzo, Kimari insignificant Ranzo. At least he kind of works in the sphere grid? I pretty much used him as a proxy to get spells for everybody else and didn't bother using or leveling him up at all. Which is another positive aspect of the sphere grid is that even Kimari has a purpose, to help make everyone else better. That's how good the sphere grid is! Even Kimari can do something! To provide a much needed break from constant battling, a healthy amount of puzzles show themselves at a handful of temples throughout the story. They occur naturally, since they're landmarks of the journey, and each have what is essentially a switch puzzle. Move orbs around to reveal a door or path to reach the end. You can only hold one orb at a time, because Titus has the intelligence of a, well, a blitzball player forcing the puzzle and orb switching to have extra steps to make it slightly more difficult. I remember hating these when I was younger, because they were so confusing and annoying. Turns out, they're really not that bad at all. Very straightforward and quick to finish. They last just long enough to give your mind a different exercise than fighting, but not so long they cause a lot of irritation. There's a hidden treasure in each one, and going for those takes more effort, but getting through them is no issue at all. Turns out, I was just a dumb kid who couldn't figure out anything originally. You know, the case with most games. I'm happy with the temple sections, since they do break up the pacing enough between travel, towns, and battle without being too numerous. They provide just enough of a breather and reignite my excitement to get back to fighting. Because let's face it, the real draw of the gameplay is the sphere grid and the fantastic turn-based battles. Honestly, this same system could be used in an all-new game today, and it would still be just as good. I'm shocked it hasn't been already. For as early 2000s as Final Fantasy X gets, its battle system and its sphere grid leveling system is as modern as it gets. Equally early 2000s is the presentation of it all. The graphics are the definition of early PS2 title, though its mix of CG background and rendered scenery allows for some new and inventive camera angles. The camera almost changes too much, honestly. In fact, I'm pretty sure the only reason it has the minimap up in the corner at all is to help the player keep going in the direction they intended between every single camera switch. Speaking of, I'm going to point something out to you, and once you notice it, you'll never unsee it. During numerous cutscenes, when it changes angles, the previous shot will freeze on its final frame and crossfade into the next shot. This is entirely a stylistic choice, and personally, I can't stand it. It's obnoxious, it takes me out of the moment, and they're used in moments where it doesn't make sense and disrupts the attention of the viewer. Crossfades are used to depict a passage of time, and where they're used in the same scene but just to change angles, it causes a visual distortion of the time and space that the scene itself takes place in. Making them worse is that they're inconsistent. They'll show up when they shouldn't, and then not be used in cutscenes where it would make sense. Sometimes they crossfade for a full second or two, sometimes it's only for like 10 frames. But also like, why the freeze frame? I can't stand it, it drives me nuts. It's all I can see and I keep being taken out of the scene as I internally ask myself, okay why was that there? Was it trying to tell me? Now, to be fair, it does work in some situations. For example, whenever Titus is narrating and giving an internal monologue, that crossfade helps brings us into his thoughts and denote that he isn't entirely in the scene around him, he's in his head. I like it when it's used here, otherwise though, it irritates me to no end. If it doesn't bother you, great, I'm envious. To me, all I see is an outdated blemish that wasn't even a good idea to begin with. It's like someone discovered transitions for the first time in Windows Movie Maker and just shotgunned them out wherever they thought it would look the coolest. It's a skill, and it requires a trained eye for this kind of thing. And now that you know about it, it's all you'll ever see. Despite all that, the cutscenes are pretty good. Again, that early 2000s crustiness is still there, 
but this presentation elevated Final Fantasy from a generally niche genre in series to the gold standard. Much like how Final Fantasy VII did, X further established the quality that people expected when it came to RPGs, or even most PlayStation 2 games. All the mannerisms and movements are certainly a bit more stiff compared to today's standards, but no more over-the-top or anime-ish than current Final Fantasy games. Hey, whoa! I wanna go home! The only notable rough spot is the lip-syncing, but quite frankly, that was a luxury for any game at that time. Maybe it's just because I grew up with this and am completely used to it, but I am not bothered by these simple lip-flaps. I really don't see it as a detriment at all. I gotta ask though, what's with all the butt shots? Way too often the camera's very clearly focusing on someone's ass. I'm trying to pay attention to what they're saying and suddenly all I can see is ass, ass, ass and titus. Ass, ass, titus, titus, ass and titus. Ass, titus, ass and titus. Ass, ass, titus, titus, ass and titus. This is thanks to very competent voice acting. Not excellent, but you can tell that it's all done by experienced actors who do a great job with what they're given. I didn't feel any of the voice delivery itself necessarily impacted any given line in a meaningful way, or enhanced the emotion or subject matter behind it. It's more that the voices existing at all helped make any given scene feel more real. All right, let's talk about it. The elephant in the room. The most notorious scene in all of Final Fantasy X the most common meme, and likely the only thing people think of whenever anyone brings up Final Fantasy X. The laughing scene. You've seen it, I've seen it, everyone has seen it. The one part that people point to to say, LOL, look how cringy voice acting was in 2001! However, just like everything else you've ever seen on social media, context was left out. By the way, from here on out in this video, story spoilers. At this point, Yuna tells Titus about how as a symbol of hope for the world, she has to keep a smile on her face. She has to stay cheerful, no matter the circumstance, so that everyone looking up to her does not fall into despair. So she does the best thing she can think of to keep theirs, and her own, spirits up. Quite literally, laugh in the face of danger. She offers this as advice to Titus, who has been struggling with the thoughts of his abusive father, Jekt, and now knowing that the ferocious creature terrorizing the world, Sin, is now embodied by Jekt. He knows he's going to have to fight and kill his father. So to power through and stay determined, he takes Yuna's advice. <laughs> in solidation, Yuna joins in, because part of her summoner's journey to defeat Sin requires Yuna to sacrifice herself. Yuna, to keep her resolve, is laughing in the face of death. <laughs> so yes, the laughing is forced, it's awkward, it's cringy, because it's supposed to be. You probably shouldn't laugh anymore. Contextually, this scene is meaningful, important, and bittersweet. The laughing scene in Final Fantasy X is one of the best, most poignant moments. Look, if you want to make fun of the voice acting anywhere in here, make fun of all the weird parts where they clearly had to speed up the voice file just to fit it in. I wanted to see Yuna's statue too, but I wanted to see it with Yuna by my side. <laughs> what the hell? I guess that would be my one criticism of it all. A lot of the voice directing is weird, but the voice acting is serviceable. One of the most divergent aspects is the soundtrack. There's still a couple of iconic staples. A chocobo theme. The prelude mixed into the Blitzball music. and the victory fanfare at the end of each battle. Sadly, for the first time since Final Fantasy II, the Final Fantasy theme is nowhere to be heard, not even during the end credits. That's the only omission that saddens me. That said, overall, the score is great in its own unique way. There's an entirely different vibe that this music has. It's less orchestral epic of seriousness and more tropical atmosphere. Most songs and themes are very chill. Some of my personal favorites are Ryuku's theme, the optimistic mood of Besaid Island, and the rather silly for no reason sounding Mihan Highway. Also, can I just say, I like the battle theme. It's catchy, memorable, I never get sick of it, but goddamn, it goes too hard at the start! 
It's an auditory whiplash when the rest of the soundtrack is so subdued. Again, it isn't bad, just so abrupt and loud, especially when paired with the glass-shattering transition. I'd just be moving along, chilling to the music, maybe enjoying the sunshine, and ba 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 God, just give me a second! Equally worth noting is the beautiful and pivotal piece that is the emotional cornerstone of the whole game, Suteki Dine. There's a reason it's used as the basis for Yuna's theme as well, and its melancholic melody is a perfect representation for Yuna and her emotional struggles. Something that has helped Final Fantasy X stay relevant for so long and endure for so long is how simple its story is. And I mean that in a good way. It's a generally pretty basic story, and it's very easy to follow. It starts out simple. It's about Yuna's summoner journey with her guardians and newcomer Titus protecting her to defeat Sin, the destructive evil, and keep the world safe for the next 10 years, until Sin's return. It's easy to follow along with the first half of the plot, going from temple to temple as you acquire more summons to use against Sin. All the while, everything you encounter is establishing excellent world building. There's talks about Spira, how the people suffer and resort to faith to get through their days, the devastation they've suffered, and how they goddamned love Blitzball. Which, one of the things I greatly appreciate about the way the story is told is that there are no sudden surprise big twists at the very last second. In fact, it's the opposite. You're told all of the twists long before they happen. You find out that Jekt is Sin only a few hours in. The clergy being controlling and evil is made apparent quickly, as is the obvious fact that Seymour is evil. You learn that Oron is an unsent spirit long before the final sending ceremony. Even the final, final boss is established clearly before he even shows up, avoiding that trap of the super secret evil bad guy behind all the other bad guys. What also helps make this all easy to follow are how simplistic the characters are. There really isn't a lot of depth or complexity to any of them, but they're also not one note or over exaggerated caricatures. None of them go through any kind of meaningful growth outside of Waka. The story here is more about what happens to the characters and what happens next, rather than examining how it affects them and how they change. This isn't typically my preference when it comes to a story. I like dissecting the characters and looking at the why instead of the what. But they all do what they're meant to, fulfill a role. I love how Lulu acts as a protective big sister to Yuna without being doting. I hope you hurt them. Oron's experience as a guardian allows him to be a proper mentor for Titus and provide guidance to Yuna when needed as well. Waka and Riku provide foils for the merits of unyielding faith, the usefulness of Machina, and outright racism. They each have likable traits, and it's easy to see why so many of them became favorites of so many people over the years. Again, they aren't incredibly complex, and pretty much everybody acts as a support for Titus and Yuna, but they're good. The cast reminds me of early Final Fantasy games, like 1 through 5. Simple, effective, and memorable in their own right. One of the most fascinating storytelling tools Final Fantasy X uses is that Titus and the player don't know that Yuna's journey will end in her sacrifice until several hours in, leaving the player in the dark. Then, after coming up with a way to defeat Sin without Yuna's sacrifice, the Faith reveal that doing so will free the Faith of their sort of imprisonment and free all of the summons. But then they reveal that Titus himself was created by them to stop the cycle. Defeating Sin in Yuyevin will also mean the disappearance, or death, of Titus. This causes a role reversal of Yuna and Titus and the player. Now Yuna doesn't know that success means the end of Titus, while Titus and the player do. It's incredibly well done, and I love that kind of narrative flip. By the way, I know the faith state that Titus was made by them and that he's a dream, but he isn't a literal dream. He's conjured up in the same way that every other Aeon is, just like Jekt and Xanarkin is basically the world they stay in when they aren't being used. Titus isn't a dream. He's a summon. Just to clarify that so nobody rages at the it was all a dream trope. The relationship between Titus and Yuna is what makes the story so fascinating to begin with. Titus narrates almost the entirety of the plot, has numerous internal monologues, and we see the world of Spira from his point of view. Sometimes Yuna would just stare off into the distance. I finally understood why. However, there is one simple fact to keep in mind. Titus is not the protagonist. Yuna is. The entire journey is Yuna's, and Titus is a supporting character who joins partway through. 
It's about her going through the summoner rituals, obtaining her abilities, and traveling across the world for her to achieve the ultimate goal, sacrificing herself to defeat Sin. Going from temple to temple is solely for her benefit, and the side characters are all left outside while she completes the ritual, including Titus. Every NPC that shows up only directly addresses Yuna, showing direct conflict with her and every antagonist is against her. Titus is just there for the ride. He's the side love interest, witnessing it all with no direct input or driving force to the outcome of events. Ultimately, it doesn't change a whole lot of the interpretation of the plot, but much like the information role reversal mentioned earlier, this role reversal of making the player as a side character offers an interesting perspective especially in being the love interest rather than pursuing one. While Final Fantasy X is a love story, it's less about them realizing their feelings for one another. The undertone throughout is that they know they like each other, but fully understand that they can never be together. At first, it's because Yuna knows completing her journey will mean the end of her life and leaving Titus. Then, as they discover another way instead, it means that Titus' life will end and Yuna left unaware. At one point or another, they both acknowledge that it won't end well. This is what makes the scene in Makalania Lake so bittersweet. The two of them, feeling the hopelessness of the situation, indulge in a fantasy of going off together to visit Xanarkin. We'll have a big party at my place! And then we could see Blitzball. That's right! Your Xanarkin Abes would play? Yeah! We could all watch you play. In the stadium all lit up at night, I'd cheer and cheer till I couldn't cheer anymore. Yeah, right on! They know it can never, ever happen, which causes Yuna to break down. Distraught and overcome with emotion, they take comfort in each other, for however fleeting it may be. After several games in a row that has a love story be some or even a primary component to the plot, Final Fantasy X's not having the happiest ending is a welcome change of pace. What this love story did, along with the voice acting, the music, the character design, is achieved something that Final Fantasy games had struggled with. It reached a vast female demographic. It may sound silly or even unnecessary to bring up now, but two decades ago, this was a big deal and a huge step forward. It was prominent enough that when Square made their first ever direct sequel game, Final Fantasy X-2, they chose to focus on an all-female cast and further expand upon the story. By the way, this game is tight. Give it another play. It's super fun. There are some weak elements to the story, so it isn't infallible. Seymour's grand scheme is to be the new head maester, so he wants every single person of the world to love him. This way he can control them and make them do what he says. Which is why he tries to marry Yuna, because everyone already likes her, so thus he'd be liked by association. So to stop him, in the middle of the wedding ceremony, Yuna literally pulls her sending staff out of her ass? And then you kill him again anyway? So he keeps coming back again and again because now his ultimate plan is to make himself into sin so that he can kill everybody in the world. Because as he puts it, the only way to end everybody's suffering is to kill everybody so that nobody ever feels anything ever again. Yeah, he's one of those villains. While not necessarily a weak point, it is worth noting that the game as a whole doesn't get incredibly engaging until after the second half. The hour spent going from temple to temple is fine enough, as it does a great job with all the world building and establishing most aspects of everything around you. The sphere grid is even just okay enough. It just kind of suffices until you start hitting the major plot reveals and the real villains begin to show themselves. It takes a bit for the real investment to begin. The sphere grid is the same way. At the start, it's pretty straightforward and not a whole lot going for it, but towards the end, you have many more paths open, interesting decisions, and more key unlocks allowing customization. The whole game doesn't start out weak, it's that it starts out pretty okay, and then ends strong. A testament to how strong the gameplay is, is that once you realize you're near the end, you want to keep playing. You want more sphere grid stuff, more rare item findings, or even more mini games. More than any other Final Fantasy game, 10 makes me want to keep playing at the end. The sphere grid alone is enticing enough to make me want to unlock more, especially finding rare level 4 key spheres or trying wacky builds. Should you ever need a break from all the world saving or whatever, you always have plenty of minigames available to you. The main one being the ever prominent Blitzball. Blitzball is essentially underwater rugby soccer, with RPG stats leveling up and mini battles within. You can access it at any save point and play as much or as little as you want. Plus, nearly every NPC you run into can be recruited onto your team, letting you explore different team members. And here's the thing with Blitzball. It sucks. 
You have little control over the outcomes of everything during a match. You have zero player input when you don't have the ball, forcing you to watch team members swim around automatically, like idiots, and inevitably screw something up. When any kind of shot, pass, or tackle maneuver is performed, it all comes down to stats. Is the block stat higher than the shoot stat? Does the tackle stat bring the defense stat down to zero? But even those are randomized, being as ineffective as 50% or overperforming up to 150% of the stat. So, a majority of every outcome is watching the dice roll and hoping for the best, especially when you're on defense, hoping, just hoping, that you tackle hard enough or your goalie manages to get their head out of their ass. Look, I even got the jet shot and still couldn't win the first match after a few attempts. There was a time where I literally never got to press anything on the controller and just watched the whole team lose despite my screaming like that one dad at the youth t-ball game taking it way too seriously. Once you recruit better members, level up player stats, and acquire new special abilities though, Blitzball then becomes too easy. Almost immediately, frankly. All the challenge and excitement is gone as victory is all but assured, leaving it an empty experience. Like I said though, you'll want to do these minigames because the rewards and endgame content is so worth it. Every character has ultimate weapons that they can get, and they are awesome. Probably the best final weapons they've ever done in the entire series because of something they've never done in Final Fantasy before. The ability to go beyond 9999 damage. The damage limit break is the coolest thing. After decades of hitting that ceiling, we can finally go beyond! It absolutely makes every boss battle a joke, but man, now that's a power trip I can get behind. So how do you get these ultimate weapons? Well, for the most part, the mini games. Some are time wasters like Blitzball, others are brief agitation like chocobo racing and getting slapped in the face by birds. Easily the worst one though, dodging lightning strikes. For Lulu's ultimate weapon, you have to not get hit by lightning. When the screen flashes, you have the smallest of windows to hit the X button to jump backwards. Miss that and bzzzt! Anyone who has ever accomplished this will have immediate war flashbacks when you bring up the Thunder Planes. Because to get the weapon piece, you don't need to just dodge lightning to the end. You don't need just to dodge lightning 50 times. You have to dodge lightning strikes 200 times in a row without stopping. And there's no counter by the way. You need to keep track of it yourself manually. And if you check it too early or god forbid miscount, whoopsie doodle start over again. But the payoff though, you'll want it so badly. The mini games give enough incentive to at least attempt them. There's also finding secret coordinates on the world map or hidden dungeons, treasure chests and extra bosses. You can even get completely optional aeons for Yuna to summon. Some of these providing additional bits of lore and story. The end game of Final Fantasy X is so strong and a major part of that is thanks to all of these extra goals to accomplish. A general summary of Final Fantasy X is that it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's good, but then it gets really good in the second half. One of the most frequent questions that I've always gotten is somebody asking if they wanted to get started on the Final Fantasy series, where should they begin? And my answer has always been the same. If you want a retro classic feeling one, go with any version of Final Fantasy IV. If you want a more modern feeling game with voice acting and cutscenes and all that, you should absolutely play Final Fantasy X. So much of it holds up to this day. It has one of the best battle systems yet. A great take on leveling up, perfect difficulty curve, and plenty of player engagement. The story is good. The easy to follow nature of the start of it eases any player into a much grander narrative by the end. The characters are generally likable, easy to understand, and easy to sympathize with. Some of the voice acting does have its awkward deliveries, but it's generally done well enough that it enhances every cutscene. It's easy to recommend thanks to its wide availability. The HD version is on pretty much every major platform you can think of. It's also one of the few that I recommend anyone who has played once before to go back and play again. So many of the scenes in dialogue hit differently the second time through once you understand and realize the undertones. Plus with the HD version, a new advanced sphere grid provides a fresh enough experience that it's worth going through again. Final Fantasy X has impressed me with how well it's held up. I now have a deeper appreciation for what it accomplished and what it was trying to go for than I ever did before, and I already liked it well enough. If you're considering it giving another go or trying it out for the first time, I can assure you it's worth it. You can enjoy the battles, you can enjoy the story, you can enjoy the emotions, you can enjoy the characters, and of course, you can enjoy all the eye candy 